Good morning, everyone. I am Kamaya Raccone, and welcome to today's webinar, which is hosted by the Clean Energy Solution in partnership with Efficiency for Access Coalition. Today's webinar is focused on the state of off-grid appliance market, connecting to the data on market trends jobs and SDG7. All right. Before we begin, I'll quickly go over some webinar features. For audio, you have two options. You may either listen through your computer or over your telephone. If you choose to listen through your computer, please select the mic and speakers option in the audio pane. Doing so will eliminate the possibility of feedback and echo. If you choose to dial in, please phone in by selecting the telephone option, and a box on the right side will display the telephone number and audio pin you should use to dial in. If anyone is having any technical difficulties with this webinar, you may contact the GoToWebinars help desk at 888-259-3826 for assistance. If you would like to ask a question, we will have um, you use the questions pane where you may type in your question. The audio recording and presentations will also be posted on the Solutions Center training page within a few days of the broadcast. And we will also add this to the Solutions Center YouTube channel where you'll be able to find other informative webinars as well as video interviews with thought leaders on clean energy policy topics. Finally, one important note of mention before we begin our presentation is that the Clean Energy Solutions Center does not endorse or recommend specific products or services. Information provided in this webinar is featured in the Solutions Center's resource library as one of many best practice re resources reviewed and selected by technical experts. Today's webinar agenda is centered around presentations from Dahlberg's presenters, Michael, Natalie, and Kieran, discussing SOGAM household and SOGAM SW supplement, SWP supplement, plus ISD Pulse, followed by our expert panelists, Denny, Sylvia, Dr. Rebecca, Naomi, and Lindsay, where powerful all panels will discuss powering job works. Powering, powering jobs work as it relates related to the SOGA, excuse me, SOGAM and Pulse findings on the GOGLA panelists that will discuss the data collection efforts and how it has fed into reports like this that we're discussing today. In addition, Jenny will also be um, our moderate, mo moderator today, helping us with questions for our expert panelists. Before we go ahead and go into our presentations, I would like to talk to you about I, um, our Clean Energy Solutions Center and what that entails. And then we will continue on with our presenters. The Solutions Center was launched in 2011 under the Clean Energy Ministerial. The Clean Energy Ministry is a high-level global forum to promote policies and programs that advance clean energy technology, to share lessons learned and best practices, and to encourage the transition to global energy economy. 24 countries and the European Commission are members, contributing 90% of energy investment and responsible for 75% of global greenhouse gas emissions. This webinar is provided by the Clean Energy Solutions Center, which is an initiative of the Clean Energy Ministerial. The Solutions Center focuses on helping government policies design and adopt policies and programs that support the deployment of clean energy technologies. This is accomplished through access to no-cost expert policy assistance and capacity building activities such as this webinar. The Clean Energy Solutions Center is co-sponsored by the governments of Australia and the United States. The Solutions Center provides several clean energy policy programs and services, including a team of over 60 global experts that provide remote and in-person technical assistance to governments and government-supported institutions, a no-cost virtual webinar training on a variety of clean energy topics, partnership building with development agencies and regional and global organizations to deliver support, an online library containing over 3,500 clean energy policy-related publications, tools, videos, and other resources, our primary audience is made up of energy policymakers and analysts from governments and technical organizations in all countries. But we also strive to engage with private sector, NGOs, and civil society. The Solutions Center is an international initiative that works with more than 35 international partners across a suite of different programs. Several of the partners are listed above and include research organizations like ARENA and IEA programs um, like C4ALL and regional focus entities such as the ECOWAS Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency. 
So our key feature of the Solution Center provides is the no-cost expert pa uh, policy assistance known as Ask an Expert. The Ask an Expert service matches policymakers with one of more than 60 global experts selected as authoritative leaders on specific clean energy finance and policy topics. The assistance is provided free of charge, and if you have questions for our experts, please submit it through our simple online form at cleanenergysolutions.org slash expert. We also invite you to spread the word about this service to those in your networks and organizations. This webinar is an activity of the Distributed Rural Energy Data Network in partnership with Decisioncy for Access. Increased interest in and availability of and decentralized renewable electrification technologies has led to the emergence of new opportunities to learn about their impact. However, re currently researchers and stakeholders operating in or exploring this sector do not have current and easy way of learning about the latest research or to search, share their own findings, needs, and experience leading across over in efforts and a lack of awareness of important research gaps, results, and learnings. We will also have a resources uh, slide at the end of this webinar so you can learn more about this awesome <clears throat> collection of researchers. Next is um, the Energy for Access. They are a global coalition promoting promoting energy efficiency as potent catalyst in energy, clean energy access efforts. Since its founding in 2015, Efficiency for Access has grown from a year-long call to action and collaborative effort by Global Leap and Sustainable Energy for All to a coalition of 14 donor organizations. Again, we can find more information on the resources list at the end of this webinar. We're going to go ahead and introduce our first uh, presenters of this webinar. First, we have Michael Kazan, who is our partner with Dahlberg. Michael is a partner who splits his time between the U.S. and Africa and co-leads Dahlberg's global energy practice. Michael is a leading expert on off-grid energy access, markets in the developing world, and has spent the past decade working in sub-Saharan Africa, South and Southeast Asia, and Latin America. Next is Natalie Hudson. Natalie is a project <clears throat> manager with Dahlberg Narabi excuse me, Nairobi office focusing in the inclusive business practice area and worked the African con continent. <clears throat> Her expertise is in business models serving rural customers, notably in the nutrition, agriculture, finance, and energy spaces. And finally, we have Karen Wilmot. Um, he is a project manager at Dahlberg, leading consulting teams and complex analysis that drives Dahlberg's strategy, work for multilateral corporate clients, foundations, utility companies, and NGOs. Karen's work has focused on strategic planning for new initiatives, investment appraisal, private sector de development, market entry strategy, and program delivery across the energy, water, infrastructure, and agriculture sectors. So at this time, I will turn this over to Michael, Natalie, and Karen to present. Terrific, thank you very much, Camiria. Good morning, everyone. Um, so we'll, we will start, we'll have three uh, quick presentations. Uh, the first of these is on the state of the off-grid appliance market report, uh, which uh, uh, CLASP and uh, Dahlberg are launching under the Efficiency for Access Coalition uh, um, uh, uh, right now, and, and some of you may have seen some earlier versions of this, but th this is a, a formal a launch of the report. So I'm going to take about 15 to 20 minutes to quickly go through the findings, and then I'm going to hand over to my colleagues to take us through a, a, a companion uh, piece that we have done on solar water pumps, um, and then also to talk through the work that we've done with uh, the World Bank and IFC on uh, productive use for um, energy appliances, which which uh, which is a broader look at the uh, for productive off-grid appliances for uh, agriculture. Uh, so if we can go to the next page, please. So this report builds on work that CLASP and Dahlberg did uh, three years ago um, uh, in publishing the, the first ever state of the off-grid appliance market report. That report concluded that there was significant promise 
in the off-grid appliance market with early movers beginning to find proof points, but that much more was needed on product innovation, uh, supply chains, and financing. Since that report, a lot has happened in the broader off-grid market and in the off-grid appliance market, um, including a number of programs that CLASP uh, has been leading, uh, the data from which, uh, most notably uh, from Global Leap Award competitions, uh, the LEA program and a results-based financing program for off-grid appliances, uh, the data from all of that is, 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 is fed into this report. Uh, next page, please. So the overall objective of this 2019 uh, refresh report is to build on the earlier report um, and to help elevate and accelerate investment and action into the off-grid appliance space uh, by providing a refresh fact base on where the sector stands and where it's going. In terms of scope, specifically, we are focusing in on household appliances, and we're using televisions, fans, and refrigerators as a proxy for the broader off-grid appliance uh, market. Uh, the reason that these three appliances have been chosen is that they are, you know, aside from off-grid lighting uh, appliances and uh, uh, smaller things like radios and, and phones. These are, the, these are among the, the top um, most in-demand appliances by households across a wide range of geographies. So we're, the report is taking a, a global view, uh, but we're focusing in on some representative markets uh, in Africa and South Asia. So we looked specifically at eight markets uh, to illustrate out the, the trends that we'll be calling, calling out in, in, in the next 15 minutes, specifically India, Myanmar, Kenya, and Uganda, uh, Ethiopia, Nigeria, Cote d'Ivoire, and Sierra Leone. Go to the next page, please. So just, just to make sure that uh, the definitions we're using are clear, um, the report focuses on what we're calling off-grid and weak-grid appliances. These are appliances that are adapted for off-grid settings and also for weak grid settings. Uh, we're defining weak grid as uh, weak grid households, as households that uh, do have access to the grid, but the quality of the grid is uh, intermittent um, and um, um, real access to, to electricity only comes for a half the day or less. Within this overall category of uh, weak and off-grid appliances, there are kind of two broad uh, subcategories. One, one subcategory are generic uh, off-grid appliances, and the second one are what we're calling off-grid appropriate appliances. Uh, off-grid appropriate appliances are the high-quality, efficient appliances uh, that are intentionally designed for off-grid and weak-grid users and uh, that uh, tend to have a much stronger uh, performance profile from perspective of durability, uh, service quality, and, uh, and especially energy efficiency. They also tend to be a bit more expensive. Uh, so the report covers both. Uh, most of our data is on off-grid appropriate appliances, which we'll talk about um, uh, shortly. If, uh, if you go to the next page, please. So quite a few messages coming out of the report. I will not go through these to the executive summary here, uh, but you'll be able to read that if uh, you look at the report once it's posted uh, after at the end of the, the webinar. Uh, next page, please. So before we go into some of the, the messages around demand, supply, the enabling environment, and, and where the sector uh, is heading, the first important thing to highlight uh, is uh, the impact of um, off-grid household appliances. And then the report provides a refreshed uh, look at the literature on impact. Uh, you probably cannot see this very clearly in the graphic, uh, 
uh, because the text is quite quite small. But you know, fundamentally, the household off-grid appliances have a strong impact across multiple SDGs. Uh, the first and obviously most obvious uh, impact is on SDG, SDG 7, on energy access, uh, because these appliances allow consumers to fully benefit from access to energy. Uh, in addition, these appliances provide the demand pool that helps uh, build the, the economics and, and helps support the growth of the broader off-grid uh, energy space and, and, and potentially in the future, the mini-grid um, energy space. Uh, beyond SDG 7, just calling out a few of the other major impact areas, uh, so there's growing evidence around the impact of uh, these appliances on poverty, particularly when households use these appliances to generate some revenue. So uh, this is, this is um, we have the strongest evidence around the use of refrigerators to generate revenues, and also some less directly um, uh, use of TVs and, and fans. And uh, the, 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 those impacts can be very, very substantial. So for instance, when households use um, refrigerators, based on some data from, uh, from Uganda research conducted by CLASP, uh, we've seen, um, the incomes of uh, small uh, and micro businesses at the uh, the ground level double on a daily basis uh, from using refrigerators in their in their businesses. Uh, the second major area of impact is is on health, where there are multiple health benefits uh, from refrigerators, fans, and in particular um, uh, electric cook stoves, um, and this spans. Um, uh, reducing food uh, waste and spoilage um, to 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 the use of refrigerators in, in health clinics um, uh, to uh, the use of fans uh, to improve quality of life uh, and reduce the the negative impacts of uh, heat waves um, and of course with electric cook stoves uh, you know displacing traditional cooking sources the reduction of indoor air pollution and, and the 4 million plus deaths that um, um, result from indoor air pollution. Uh, there are also impacts on education, um, SDG 4, on gender equality through time poverty savings, uh, SDG 5, and on jobs. And th there's now quite a bit of evidence uh, on jobs more broadly for off -grid, um, the off-grid space uh, based on recent publications by Gogwa. Uh, next page, please. So now just hitting some highlights of the size of the opportunity. So on demand, a little bit on the supply market, um, dynamics and business models, product and technology trends, consumer insights, and then flipping into conditions for market growth and pathways to that, to that growth and, and, and sort of some recommendations on the, on the way forward. Uh, next page, please. So first, just starting on the demand side, uh, the first important thing to highlight is that there's a large uh, off-grid and we-grid population, uh, which is uh, in, in some geographies continuing to, in many geographies continuing to grow uh, as grid growth lags behind population growth. And as the quality of the grid uh, is in many cases not improving or not improving quickly. And, and this large off-grid and Uyghur population, which we estimated 475 million households globally at the end of 2018, is, is both the foundation and the engine for off-grid uh, appliance uh, demand.
though the usage, the household energy consumption right now is magnitudes lower than in uh, the developed world. So for instance, uh, you can see that in the box at the bottom here, in US and Europe, household energy cons average household energy consumption is five to 10 times greater than the average for, than for average household in India, 10 to 20 times greater than for an average household in, in Nigeria, and 20 to 200 times greater than the average um, uh, household in rural Africa. Uh, you can see that reflected in current penetration rates for appliances. So as far as we know, this is the first time that uh, someone has, has gone in and uh, tried to get this data in a true cross-regional uh, basis. So uh, on the left side here, you can see that total penetration of uh, televisions in, we estimate the total penetration of television, uh, televisions in Africa, sub Saharan Africa, 35% of households, 17% uh, of households have refrigerators, and um, the data here is patch here, so we estimate between 12 to 18% of households have fans. Um, if you compare that to India, uh, in Asia, uh, that's that's for roughly half of uh, the levels of uh, appliance penetration in in Asia, and so these are all appliances, both off grid and on grid. Uh, but if you look at rural penetration, that's where uh, these numbers are very very low, uh, particularly if you compare that to almost universal penetration of televisions and refrigerators uh, in higher income countries. Uh, you can also see the the, the, the the very low levels of appliance access uh, by looking at the number, the average number of appliances per household. So on the right side of this page, you can see that based on survey household survey data in countries like the US, UK, Spain, Korea, and Japan, average an average household has between 12 uh, to 40 uh, electric appliances. Uh, in rural India, that's three to 10. Uh, appliances and in sub-Saharan Africa there's just two to five appliances including mobile phones and so when you add all of that up what that means is that uh, just to illustrate just how striking this disparity is that Japan with one-tenth of the people in sub-Saharan Africa has 25 percent more refrigerators and TVs uh, than the entire sub-Saharan Africa region and, and survey data tells us that when you ask people, when you ask households um, what they would like, uh, people report very significant demand uh, for, appliance, uh, for appliances, particularly televisions and uh, uh, refrigerators and, and fans. Uh, next page, please. So while demand is high, the ability to afford these appliances is very low. Without financing, just assuming that uh, households are able to pay uh, at most two months of savings for an upfront appliance purchase, uh, you can see the contrast here between the yellow and the blue bars. Um, so without financing, uh, the market, especially for, for higher cost appliances like televisions, and particularly for refrigerators, um, essentially drops significantly or, or even goes to almost to zero uh, because of the high cost of such appliances. Uh, with financing, the market uh, can, be, can be quite uh, substantial. Uh, next page, please. So in the report, we talk about the total addressable market for appliances and the total obtainable market. Uh, the addressable market, uh, focuses on the subset of the off-grid and we-grid households who can afford an off-grid appliance provided that they have access to financing on sort of typical uh, market uh, terms. Um, the addressable market, um, you know, as you can see here, is let's say roughly half of the total number of off-grid and we-grid households uh, for uh, televisions and uh, uh, for fans, um, and is roughly 15% of that for um, uh, higher cost products like refrigerators. 
The obtainable market, however, is much smaller. Uh, the obtainable market imposes additional uh, real-world constraints on demand, uh, including consumer finance, the availability of finance, as well as physical accessibility uh, of these households, uh, which we proxy uh, with their proximity to roads. Uh, next page, please. So if you add it all up, uh, we get to, at the end of 2018, we get to a total obtainable market size of $12.6 billion, uh, which is significantly bigger than our estimates um, just a few years ago. And most of this is, uh, most of this obtainable market is in South Asia and in Sub-Saharan Africa. So on the left side, you can see here uh, that, uh, sorry, right side, you can see that that, that adds up to $3.5 billion in Sub-Saharan Africa, $7.7 .7 billion in South Asia, um, or roughly a bit over 11 billion across across the two regions. If you go to the next page, please. So looking ahead, uh, we've projected the growth of the addressable and, and most importantly, the obtainable market uh, based on population growth, based on the increase in income levels, uh, based on uh, trends around uh, appliance product uh, costs and prices, which are which are consistently falling over time with improved efficiency uh, and improved um, uh, economies of scale and competition in, in manufacturing and distribution. And finally, uh, improvements in access to uh, financing. And we see the overall market growing to $25.3 billion uh, dollars US by 2030. Most of that driven by TVs and refrigerators, so higher cost appliances. Um, and this is using what I would what I would call fairly conservative assumptions, uh, such as you know very modest declines in product costs compared to what we've seen historically. So this this these numbers could look could look much bigger uh, as well. Next page, please. The way the story plays out, it, it does look very different by market. So some markets are ready for scale. Um, there's a large potential market. There's a mature, broader off-grid solar uh, or, or mini-grid sector in, in, in a few cases. Um, and there's high um, and, and growing access to finance and critically strong government support. Then the next tier of markets we're calling high potential markets where some of these conditions are not as strong, uh, particularly uh, government support is much more patchy. And then you have nascent markets where the market may be smaller or could still actually be, potential, the potential market has to be significant, uh, but uh, the level of financing access is low and uh, there's very little government support. So there's a nuanced story here and then depending on which category the market falls in, the interventions will be somewhat uh, or should be somewhat different. Uh, next page, please. So just a few points on supply. So the data, while well, data is very incomplete, uh, now for the very, very first time, uh, we have uh, at least some data on appliance sales uh, from a survey that the Global Off-Grid Lighting Association has done earlier this year, uh, looking at sales uh, from Google members in the second half of 2018. Uh, so that information is incomplete. Not every uh, important player in the appliance market is a member of Google, and uh, critically, um, not every not every affiliate Google affiliate has replied to this. Uh, but we are now starting to get some data. Using that data, and using other information from that research, we estimate that in aggregate, uh, off-grid TV refrigerator and fan penetration. Um, Today is roughly is somewhere in the range of five to 10, 10 million units globally. Most of those are in Asia, particularly in Bangladesh, and the vast majority of these off-grid uh, appliances are generic, non um, uh, non-branded products. 
the branded products, which which uh, in many cases are the off-grid appropriate, the much more efficient off-grid appropriate appliances, are probably only 10 to 30 percent of this total. If you look specifically at the Google data, uh, we have 175,000 fans, 147,000 televisions, and just 6,000 uh, off-grid refrigerators that were sold in the second half of uh, last year. But again, this excludes. Uh, this is not a comprehensive uh, number, and hopefully, this data will improve as there is uh, there's more data collection and better data collection in, in the years to come. Um, the the, the, the sales are growing quickly. We don't have comprehensive information across the entire sector. Um, we we do based on self-reported growth in sales, where we we get numbers in the 30 to 80 percent range across these three categories of uh, off-grid appliances. Um, and if you compare this with data on off-grid solar home systems, particularly solar home systems that are uh, in the 50 to 100 watt power range or over 100 watt power, which in many cases come bundled uh, with an appliance, particularly televisions, uh, those that segment is growing at 33% uh, per each half year, so that roughly at 80%. So we think that the the, the, the range of growth is, is 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 quite robust. It's in that 30% to 80% at the very top end. Uh, but again, more data is needed to refine these estimates. Uh, next page, please. So a variety of flares, and we're seeing some a lot more definition around business models and a lot more specialization as the sector increases in complexity and increases in maturity. The, in Africa, the, the most important players from a distribution perspective are today the vertically integrated Descos, particularly the, the pay-as-you-go players, uh, that are the market leaders around televisions, fans, and um, uh, off-grid refrigerators. Um, in uh, Asia, the story is very different. Uh, most of the products that are distributed are products from generic manufacturers, original equipment manufacturers, and are distributed uh, through fairly small uh, distributors. Uh, next page, please. So consumer financing is a major driver, as we've mentioned, of the sector. In East Africa, for instance, survey data suggests that 99% of respondents purchase their off-grid television on credit. And the most common uh, pathways for off-grid financing are pay-as-you-go, uh, financing from microfinance institutions, and some uh, alternative financing models like installment uh, payments. Uh, next page, please. Uh, there is an, a portfolio, um, just flipping to uh, some nuances around product and technology trends. Um, actually, let's, let's, let's keep going. Let's go to the next page, please. So, so just digging into the portfolio of appliances, based on global LEAP Awards data, we can see a very, a few things. Number one, we can see the fact that the off-grid appliance ecosystem is growing quickly. Uh, so if you look at this, these, this data, say, five years ago, you would see very few off-grid appliance products and just a handful of manufacturers. Um, so you know, three to five brand manufacturers for each product category in 2013. Um, in 2017, there were 11 uh, TV manufacturers, um, um, eight uh, fan and seven, uh, sorry, eight refrigerator and seven off-grid fan uh, manufacturers, uh, quality product manufacturers um, across dozens of products. And we are seeing these numbers continue to grow into 2019 with the greatest round of uh, uh, Global Leap Awards. Efficiency is definitely improving. So we saw 45% improvement in TV efficiency uh, just from 2014 to 2017, and we'll, we'll, we'll get the most recent numbers from the 2019 round soon. 
Um, uh, but but you're still seeing a very big disparity between the average off-grid appliance and best-in-class appliances. So that's between 1.5, uh, the best-in-class are 1.5 to 3 times more efficient, which suggests that there's still a lot of room, even within the current technology uh, frontier, for improved efficiency, and still further technology efficiency improvements uh, coming up. So, for instance, for TV, uh, for uh, refrigerators. That's a typo. For refrigerators, uh, you know, we think uh, another 50% efficiency improvement is possible with improved insulation mater uh, materials, uh, motors, and so forth. Alongside improved efficiency, prices are falling, particularly with TVs. We've seen a 23% decline in prices between 2015 and 2018, and that's on track to uh, probably 35 to 40%, uh, certainly more than 30% by. Um, uh, by 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 uh, in the next in the next few years. Uh, next page, please. Quite a bit of technology innovation still happening that will drive those improvements in efficiency, improvements in quality and performance of these appliances. Uh, not going through these in detail, but just highlighting several, such as blade design and brushless motors. In the case of fans. Um, Improvements in luminance, uh, innovations around uh, in, in durability, uh, um, and, and just continuing improvement and efficiency for televisions, and um, the potential for much greater improvements in efficiency for refrigerators uh, through uh, improvements in materials, such as, for instance, uh, phase change materials, improve control and improve and improve controllability of these devices. Uh, next page, please. Looking to consumer insights, um, the, the 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 broadest point to make here is that you know the the demand, as as mentioned earlier, demand for these appliances is strong. Uh, you can see here that um, beyond televisions, refrigerators, and fans, there's a next tier of appliances that are coming up and that are generating quite a bit of interest, both from consumers and from manufacturers and distributors. Um, and importantly, uh, when you talk to consumers, uh, it, 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 it's clear that while affordability is still the biggest barrier and the biggest driver of appliance uptake, beyond affordability, uh, consumers are increasingly focused on quality. Um, and as a result, manufacturers and distributors are, are, are increasingly focused on consumer depth of performance. So whether it be um, aesthetics, uh, durability or other features um, uh, that uh, consumers uh, prefer for specific products. Next page. So wrapping all of this up, um, there are a number of conditions that we, we highlight as being essential for uh, supporting market growth, including financial incentives, both at the level of consumers and at the level of the overall uh, supply chain uh, to drive this ecosystem forward. Um, important conditions from perspective of policy um, in terms of national energy policies, taxes and tariffs, uh, policies uh, around mini grid development, um, and uh, policies around uh, 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 you know standards and such issues as as e waste. Um, the need for continuing to build consumer awareness and the need to continue to innovate around distribution uh, to solve the last mile uh, distribution challenge. Uh, next page. So in terms of where all of this is going, uh, we do see the addressable, the sort of the market growing quite quickly. We see sales growing quickly, but we think that much, much faster growth is possible if a few things happen. So the first of this is, is highlighted around policy. It's governments um, recognizing that off-grid appliances are an important part of electrification and energy access, um, and creating enabling policies around off-grid appliances. Uh, from a finance perspective, it's, it's more dedicated financing flowing towards off-grid appliances. Uh, more knowledge sharing around what works 
and continued investment into market intelligence just so this market can be traced and so that we have better data. Uh, engagement with um, um, uh, 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 engagement with private sector to draw more private sector players in along the lines of what the Energy for Access Alliance and uh, CLASP and others are doing. And lastly, continued investment in technology with a particular focus on efficiency um, and uh, uh, costs. Next page, please. So that, that essentially takes us in a number of specific uh, policy and other levers for bringing down costs and improving affordability more broadly. Uh, so that takes us to the, 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 the main messages of the solar off-grid report. Uh, we can now quickly uh, turn to solar water pumps and um, an update on the broader productive use segment uh, before taking questions. Thanks, Mike. Um, so yeah, just um, as a transition really into a, probably a more emergent area of production, productive use appliances. Um, as part of the SOGAM work, we also extended the analysis to look at the solar water pumps market and then specifically some of the nuances and requirements for growth that are additional to those that um, Mike just mentioned. So if you just flip onto the next slide, please. Um, so the, the solar, Solar water pump um, opportunity space is really built out of uses in agriculture, which would be irrigation and livestock water, and then also drinking water. Um, the agricultural context is framed by, um, if, we, if we take sub-Saharan Africa, 95% of farmed land um, relies solely on unpredictable seasonal rainfall. 60% in South Asia, um, there's still a very large kind of requirement for um, better irrigation um, and often in off-grid areas. So there's a kind of synergy there with off-grid um, solar uh, water pumps. And then from a technology perspective, you've got larger um, submersible pumps, smaller submersible pumps with smaller areas of land, and then surface water pumps. Um, you can see there, it's quite a big range in product prices currently. Um, but they are coming down and have come down by about 80% in the last two decades. Um, so with that, there's an increasing number of players that are active in the area, um, innovating around system technology and how to deliver for clients, which means that solar water pumps could be um, moving towards their being competitive or viable against diesel incumbents or opening up solar irrigation where it wasn't possible before in off-grid or weak-grid areas. If that were to happen, um, there are a lot of touch points back to um, sustainable development goals, including, so with yield uplifts and more resilience, you can hit some poverty and hunger targets. Um, in terms of competition versus diesel, you've got, um, lower carbon emissions, so hitting some SDGs 7 and 13. And then in terms of time saving and the burden of collection of water, there's some gender related aspects as well. If you flip onto the next slide. So it, it's, it became apparent through our analysis that the market is very large, but it is definitely underpenetrated currently. Um, we focus on sub-Saharan Africa and India. Um, we projected out a, in a similar kind of methodology to the one that Mike described for um, off-grid appliances, uh, a, a market of by 2030 of around 11 billion, big number. Um, but let's just look at what's actually going on at the moment, say in a, in, in a reasonably progressed market, which is in India, um, where subsidies have been used to grow the um, installations of solar water pumps. Um, by quite a large amount in the last um, five, five to six years, but yet this still only kind of scrapes the top of um, the water pump market with still 32% um, being diesel, diesel um, powered. Um, so, and one element of that that's worth mentioning is that that was very much driven by subsidies. And um, in future, there is obviously a view of whether those subsidies will um, continue in India or whether they'll start to taper off. Um, 
by contrast to this number here, um, it, data from 2018 suggested that um, solar water pump provision um, sales in East Africa were around 5,000 in the second half of last year. So that just gives you a kind of metric of, um, you know, this is very nascent, it's emerging, and um, solar water pumps are, are not at the scale even of the um, uh, fans and refrigerators and TVs that we mentioned before. Just flip on to the next slide, please. So, important to just understand or consider a little bit about what drives demand for um, for solar water pumps, um, and then also with a view to what actually a solar water pump provides as value for customers. So, it's a lot more complex, let's say, than household appliances. So awareness and know-how is a major issue. So um, that is both around irrigation, but also, well, why would I choose solar versus diesel? Where are these products available? How reliable are they? Um, affordability, again, a big, a big issue. Um, as you saw, some of those um, product prices are at the upper end of um, uh, solar home system pricing currently. So it's a, it's a big challenge to finance them. Um, and an element there is around if you if if you are financing them, the creditworthiness of um, the, the 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 farmer or whoever is purchasing the pump, um, but also how to accommodate for incremental income, as we'll see later. Um, so, for example, in in India, farmers quote or or, or um, report that their income is boosted by over fifty percent. Um, and then the third one. That's shaping demand is really water access. So to to get you to have a pump, you need water, and so you need to be in close proximity to surface water or have access to groundwater through boreholes or wells. Um, then there's probably a more nuanced piece around the complexity of um, the prerequisites for targeting customers. Um, Irrigation is just one piece of um, of how, how what is required to create value out of owning a pump by increasing yields and by um, increasing their income. For example, um, needing fertilizers and then good farming practices um, at the front end and then towards the back end, having confidence that yes, I can increase my production, but can I actually sell it reliably through a reliable offtake of buyer into a co-op, et cetera. So really important to consider how that farmer fits into um, the broader value chain. But there are huge um, potential impacts on productivity, net income, um, time saving, and climate. If we just move on to the next slide. So the report um, goes into some detail around how solar water pumps are different from and uh, a different stage uh, from um, appliance, household appliances. Um, around four, four brackets, policy, financing, technology, and partnerships. Um, I won't go into those in detail now because I'll, I'll move on to the broader pulse, um, uh, broader productive use area, um, but we'll come back to these later and you'll see them come up. Um, so if we just flip to the next slide, please. So solar water pumps fit within the broader, broader category, uh, which we've called pulse. Um, it, and that's productive use leveraging solar energy, um, an acronym just to make an easier easier thing to say to some extent. Um, so if we just look to the next slide, this comes out of a piece of work we completed um, towards the end of 2018, um, focusing on productive use of energy, solar energy, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, and then within it focusing in, in agriculture. Uh, the piece of work um, includes some just underlying trends of what where the industry is at. Um, we looked at use cases in different countries to explore the practicalities of how to how these products actually land in the market. So market sizing, and then we spoke to um, a lot of actors, um, both in through interviews and through survey, um, to just understand their viewpoints. And then to that point, I think it's interesting to note that, as Mike mentioned in 2013, there was kind of a few uh, actors selling uh, household appliances um, that has then grown over the course um, of the last five years. I think that's probably true of um, 
pulse, but we're probably at that 2013 level. There's, there's a small number of players concentrated in um, brand, branded um, manufactured brand, branded manufactured products. Um, if we move on to the next slide. So just some quick highlights, and I won't go through these in detail, but we, we did see an increasing number of products available, more specialist providers on the market. Um, there is a significant variation in maturity of technologies and application in different markets. Um, solar water pumps is definitely the most mature uh, at different scales with cooling and refrigeration next. And then agro-processing is definitely an emerging technology group. Um, the potential is huge, um, but there is a very big uh, hacker on the potential market by that affordability constraint, which I mentioned. Um, but by 2030, rising incomes um, um, and other factors like lowering product costs will start to grow that grow that model. Uh, the next the next piece here is around how um, really the business case is not clear cut. There's a lot of complex issues around how much money the farmers stand to um, gain from adding products. What are they currently using? What how much utilization can they get out of product depending on their proximity and linkage into the downstream supply chain of um, their agricultural produce and foods. Um, so aggregation is very important and then there's a wide set of supporting um, needs uh, that different actors can contribute to and we'll get on to that next. So if you move on to the next slide please. So just we'll quickly run through the, the overall pulse landscape, some of the products and suppliers, use cases, and then kind of a what next to kind of lead into our panel discussion coming up. So if you just click onto the next slide, please. So how are we just defining pulse, uh, productive use, leveraging solar energy? So really it is, um, really it's, the, the difference would be the direct input into the production of goods and services. Um, so whereas Mike was mentioning how refrigerators can be used for income generating activities. This is really where its primary use and it's maybe some of its product design is towards that, that productive uses uh, in, the, in these different sectors. Just flip onto the next slide, please. So we, I, we, we started by just appraising the different technologies under different groups uh, and looking at um, what's out there. It became quickly apparent that agricultural um, pulse products are very much more cohesive and concentrated than any others um, and was a logical place for us to focus on. Let's just flip to the next slide. So agriculture um, is obviously a very dominant sector in rural economies, so off-grid economies. Um, it's high on government agendas um, given that the the amount of population exposed to, to the sector um, and then has some very unique sets of um, income generation and impact mechanisms. Um, and then importantly, um, farmers are seen as a key growth segment to off existing off-grid suppliers um, in terms of customer base. If you just flip to the next slide. Thank you. Um, and the next one. So we started to look at how um, products would group around their power um, capacity and their product, their processing capacity, and then whether or not they were focused on um, kind of single value chains or multiple value chains. Let's go to the next slide. And we started to focus in on uh, irrigation pumps, cooling and drying, and agro processing. Um, it's worth noting at this point that we focused on small scale applications, um, which can be powered by um, systems of a kilowatt or less. So we quite kind of call these micro pulse solutions. Um, the, th the threshold is kind of a bit arbitrary, um, but it's really around kind of what, where is that the size of the existing kind of off-grid household solar space? Um, and then it's also kind of in Lighting Global's traditional field of inquiry. Um, and so it's kind of a natural place for us to move off from that uh, the, the, the existing appliance supply chains. Um, so if we just flick onto the next slide, we started to explore how um, at different scales, the technologies in show very different maturities in market. So for solar water pumps, um, they're really the only um, technology where at different scales and at the smaller scales, there is a clear evidence of uptake and 
um, demand for those for those um, types of products. Uh, cooling, there is some demand, but it's usually at a slightly higher um, size. And then agro-processing is relatively, uh, so solar-powered agro-processing is relatively immature across the board. Um, if you just look to the next slide. So to support some of our analysis, we engaged with a number of firms from um, uh, different sets of firms, solar home system organizations, some early stage pulse innovators, uh, and then some more um, larger international manufacturers. And, and if you flip on to the next slide, they um, come from a range of different sizes, um, but most are operating at, at scales where they've sold less than 10,000 products total. Um, we surveyed across sub-Saharan Africa and um, some other geographies as well, but there was definitely a concentration around East Africa and significantly in Kenya. A lot of these firms are operating in those markets. If you just flip on to the next slide, please. So we did some analysis around um, where people currently are and where they're hoping to go, and then whether or not Pulse is a core business. So as we expected, solar water pumps is, is up there, um, followed by entertainment and agro-processing. But there's a kind of plan and intention to move more into uh, agro-processing and into communications and cool. If you flip onto the next slide. Um, and again, we saw in responses a reiteration of those different maturity levels. In fact, really only solar water pumps, so irrigation and cooling, have some actors start to feel like there's leading innovation, advanced innovation, um, or maturity. Um, if you took agro processing, I think the level of um, maturity is certainly basic or, 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 or emergent. Um, yeah, flipping on, thank you. Um, so the business cases, we we really wanted to understand how these products could be practically applied. And so we developed business cases testing their use in different value chains. So we used examples from Kenya, uh, Zimbabwe, and Cote d'Ivoire, different value chains with different products. Um, so looking at different countries allowed us to look at the different kind of structures of the agricultural sectors um, and then different maturities of the existing off-grid solar markets. Different value chains allowed us to explore exactly how these um, products can fit into what are quite the diverse um, agricultural um, subsectors. Um, and then we, we looked at how these products performed, uh, how viable they were um, against incumbents, um, the return, potential return on investment for a given owner of an asset, and then um, typical payback periods uh, to look at the incentives to, 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 to invest with. Um, so it's worth noting that just really there's a bit of a, a mixed result here. It's not clear cut. Um, the different levels of incumbency for different um, products. So you're, sometimes you're fighting against the diesel incumbent. Sometimes you're actually creating a um, processing step at a level where it doesn't currently exist within a value chain. Um, but some products like solar water pumps can show um, good payback versus a diesel pump within a year, high returns for farmers given the extra yield, and payback periods which, if you can finance the product, you should be able to incrementally increase incomes enough to enforce that, uh, reinforce that payback. Um, flipping on, interest of time, I can't go into detail on any one of these at this stage, but just to give a quick note that these are all fully detailed in the report, and um, our, the kind of process we followed methodology was to look at the value chains, look at where there is um, latent or energy needs within that value chain, look at some of the dynamics of volumes, who is actually currently in that stage of the value chain, look at the performance versus diesel, and then test some of the viability against different utilization um, parameters, and then look at some levers of how that um, use case could be improved. So if you just move to the next level, that gave us like a good sense of what some of the challenges are, um, the constraints that are facing Pulse and the scale up of Pulse in markets. Um, and it became evident that there was um, very much er energy oriented, so energy access oriented kind of constraints, and then this agricultural oriented types of, of constraints. And then counter to that is the experience and the expertise needed to solve those problems. Um, in the interest of time, I think I'll skip on from that, if possible. Um, 
so yeah so if you pause on this one so i think the again um suppliers and practitioners um in in these supply chains echoed that the availability of consumer finance is very important um may, maybe again linked to product affordability and then there's possibly some action steps around uh, customer awareness and um and, and just basic knowledge gaps around around technologies and then if we skip to the next slide um and then the next one sorry so just just to summarize as we move into a panel discussion um there is this this potential support around integrating productive use products better into um national policies both in energy policy but importantly also in agricultural policy um there's a lot of room for forming partnerships along value chains so working with aggregators of um of agricultural produce um, co-ops for example um, rural financiers uh, some of which Mike mentioned earlier and then potentially um, looking at that area of where pulse can be added into um, suppliers that don't tip, have it as a core at the moment so working with adjacent product distributors um, given the early stage and the lack of maturity in, of some products in market there's certainly a need for more R&D investment um, in more efficient DC appliances, but also product design that can help to tailor in products to their specific use case. Um, and then there is also um, obviously room for some financing uh, to, at two levels, one in consumer finance to open up affordability and de-risking some of that lending, but also a, a business level to help some of these organizations that may have um, already um, piloted to scale. Um, and one note there is that there are obviously um, a lot of potential uh, development impacts associated, associated with these products, given their income generation and links back to those SDGs, um, but also a carbon benefit versus uh, diesel incumbents where they exist. Then finally, I think um, there is, all of this can be underpinned by a theme of the need for collaboration, joint ventures and knowledge sharing between kind of traditional energy access organization players and programs and agricultural sector players donors programs and agribusiness um so i think that's it and i think we're not taking questions now but we'll be moving on to the panel discussion and then we can pick up any questions um with the uh, as within that yes correct and um, so we're, we're not going to take any questions now but please everybody continue to submit your questions and if we don't get to get to them today, we will um, individually send out um, the answers to your um, really awesome questions that you've been sending in so far. So thank you so much to Dahlberg for your outstanding presentations. And at this time, we're going to have class um, to moderate an expert panelist um, connecting the findings of the state of the off-grid market and pulse report that you guys just went over. And um, at this time, I'm going to quickly go over some brief introductions for our panelists. So first up, we have Jenny. Jenny is the Senior Manager for CLASS and has more than eight years of experience in research policy development and implementation of appliance energy efficiency and market transformation projects around the world. Next, we have Silvia, excuse me, I'm going to say her name wrong, Silvia Francisio, I believe that's how you say it. She um, who also um, is working um, as a, well, she's not separate, so she's a data uh, database specialist at GOGLA. She um, is, uh, has several data collection initiatives, including Global Off-Grid Solar uh, Market Report. And prior to that, she has been working as a scouting coordinator for the uh, Dervergy East Africa leading the team gathering data and assessing the electrification potential rural off-grid villages in Tanzania through both desk research and field trips. Next, we have Dr. Rebecca Shirley. She's the Chief Research Officer for Power for All. She is also named Africa Utility Weeks 2018 Outstanding Young, young Leader in Energy. And she works to, towards better, better access to high quality energy data and insights for the sector. Next, we have Naomi Brooks. She's the Project Coordinator at the International Finance Corporation. She's been, um, she has over 20 years of experience, uh, business development and project management, and she also speaks over five languages, which is pretty awesome. And next we have Lindsay, Lindsay Caldwell 
Mola. She's the Energy Access Consultant at World Bank Group. Um, she has 10 years of hands-on experience in the private and public sector with a focus on agriculture, energy, and access to finance. And at this time, I'm going to welcome everybody to um, the webinar, and we're going to go ahead and start asking them some awesome questions. All right, Jenny, let's, are you ready to go? Thanks, Kamira, and thanks to um, the presenters and our panelists. Um, we're very excited about this panel that we've brought together. And as stated in the title of the webinar, we wanted to you know, present some of these macro-level findings, but then use this panel and all the great work that they're doing through our partnerships with these organizations to connect the dots, not just looking at you know, market potentials and what's the state of the market, but how that really um, plays out on the ground, both in the data collection and the work that we're doing um, in collaboration with our partners on the um, distributed renewable um, data network and, uh, and, and through other work. Um, so the first question I wanted to ask is actually um, to, to Gogla, to Sylvia, because a lot of the data um, that we used in, in particularly the state of the African appliance market report came from um, the Gogla cell data collection that's done. Um, uh, on a semi-annual basis. And, um, you know, we're looking now at a lot more nascent technologies and appliances, um, you know, solar water pumps, obviously, also refrigerators and the ag processing and large-scale cold chain um, that was talked about in the Pulse report. And just would like to get your thoughts on any of the challenges or opportunities that you see in, um, in collecting this data on these nascent and emerging technologies and maybe how that differs from, the, from collecting data on um, lighting systems as you've done in the past. Hi, Jenny. I hope you can hear me fine. Thank you for the question and thank you for inviting Gogla to, to speak on this panel. Uh, yes, we were happy to to see the data featured in this report, uh, and we are very happy that even if it's like as presented very like a nascent data collection, we did the first round, and now we are about to finalize the second one, which will be released in the end of October. Um, we have learned a lot, and you, Jenny, were part of the process, so you share some of the learning for sure. But for me, the most uh, difficult thing was really like to identify the right way of speaking with the company because we do collect the data directly from them so there needs to be a strong incentive uh, for them to participate some of the players in the appliances segment especially for solar water pumps and refrigeration units are not the traditional players uh, that we have seen in our off-grid solar lighting data collection so um, they are a bit less um, acquainted with Gogla and with Efficiency Praxis Coalition, and they are not used to share their sensitive data. Uh, so we did a lot of convincing work uh, to get them to participate, and that's ongoing. So already in the second round, we saw a tremendous amount uh, of new companies joining, especially in the fan segment and in the refrigeration unit segment. So I think it's going to be a lot of convincing there to be done, but also to showcase uh, with this all of these reports, what's really um, what's the market intelligence that can drive the sector forward and the companies can use for their own fundraising and we can use to uh, drive sector support. So I think the main challenge is what really like the convincing on the company side. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, I, I just wonder if anybody else on the panel has any perspectives on this. I know, um, you know, particularly, but, you know, the Lighting Global team as you're moving, um, you know, looking at some more of the productive use products and, and also Power for All that I know has done, you know, some work um, expanding, looking at, at, at cooking, appliances and others, if there are any, you know, opportunities or, or issues in, in the data collection and what you see the greatest needs being for the sector to move things forward and how we can do that in partnership, I guess. Hi, Jenny. Hi. Go ahead. Over to you. Uh, uh, Jenny, Rebecca here speaking. Hi, good uh, morning slash afternoon, everyone. Um, I think the data, the data question is a whole nother webinar in itself. There's so many challenges that we have with um, answering these kinds of questions. Um, as the previous panelists were saying, part of the challenge is the nascency of these markets. So um, ensuring that we are collecting statistically relevant data can be a challenge if we're not both uh, you know, addressing companies as well as um, 
consumers themselves, which becomes a challenge of resource and you know and and time and and, and many other different limitations. Um, so that that's one. And then I would say that alongside that, uh, once you do do a survey to companies to understand whether it's um, you know jobs or any other sort of social impact. Um, being able to map that to macroeconomic data in a lot of these emerging markets to really think about the scale of potential can be very difficult because we don't really have very good input output data and so on. So um, I think that there's a challenge around sort of the, you know, the, the metadata that is available. Um, and then there's a challenge around, you know, uh, needing more organizations like those represented in this panel to be doing this kind of research and validating each other's studies. Yeah, uh, hi, this is Nami Brooks from Lighting Global IFC. I, I couldn't agree more. I think the other three aspects I would add is that we, um, if you are a company that's trying to enter a market, that market information is extremely valuable. But that market information is only as good as the input that we get from companies that are collaborating and willing to share that data. But there is a tension, of course, because these companies would like to guard their data um, and keep things like sales data or growth data relatively close to their chest. And I think in the interest of sort of increasing market information, it would be fantastic if we could continue collaborative programs that we have with Gogla, for example, where on a six monthly basis, we are collecting data from over 142 companies to try and inform what's happening in the market, but also what the trends are, what the growth prospects are, but what is, is needed from the, uh, the development finance uh, community. I think what is super, super exciting and what is on poised on the market front is uh, remote data that will be gathered um, hopefully within the, in the decades to come where data gathering will become a bit more um, easier and cheaper and more accurate. And so I think this will become a very, very interesting field for us. Thanks, Naomi. Um, so I want to switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit. So we talk, you know, a lot about the market potential and looking at sales and growth, but then there's also, you know, if we move upstream, looking at um, what's happening along the supply chain and, you know, the value add and also the jobs that are being created um, as um, these these appliances are, are coming to market, both, you know, yeah, along along the supply chain and also also through the distribution network, in addition to the jobs that are being created from actually using the appliances, um, you know, the, the farmers who are using the solar water pump to, you know, add value or expand land. So I know that this is something that Power for All recently um, put out put out a report on, and you know, looking at some of these numbers that Dahlberg presented on the total addressable market, and for example solar water pumps that is projected to be, you know, 15.6 billion, which is, which is a large market. And so um, I'd just like to hear, based on the work that you've done in um, Africa and South Asia, how, um, you know, this might impact deployment opportunities and workforce training. Sure. Um, thanks for that question, uh, Jenny. I think that uh, one thing that is really clear from um, the Dalberg presentation is that the future of work is really a major challenge for Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, agriculture is one of the largest employers, as we all know, uh, and is really majorly affected by climate change right now. Um, you know, I'm here in Kenya and this year the rains were really below average. I'm sure many of the listeners on this webinar are also seated here in Kenya and saw how unpredictable those rains were um, and how low they were. So, so that presents a major challenge alongside automation and other things. Uh, and at the same time as, uh, as agriculture jobs become more scarce, we're experiencing this youth explosion, right, uh, across the entire continent, where now more than 35% of the population is just between the brackets of 15 to 24 years old. Um, so that means that jobs and especially rural employment is a major policy priority. It's a major policy priority for, um, for local governments, but also for major institutions like the AFDB that's established its youth, its uh, jobs for youth initiative. So I think that, so the jobs thing is one thing. And then at the same time, another major policy priority is power. Um, and I think that what we're seeing now is especially because so many of those unelectrified are rural. There is a large push towards rural electrification strategies right now, which is great because rural communities are really best poised to benefit from energy access, uh, unlocking all the kind of productivity that the Dahlberg team was talking about before, from irrigation to milling to grinding, drying, cooling, processing. 
So these are nascent sectors, as we saw from those graphs, but they are really, um, I think, well poised, especially with access to energy as a driver to unlock economic growth and to unlock jobs creation. So really, these two pillars are intrinsically connected, energy and jobs. Um, so we did a study uh, this past year, this year um, to explore and really understand what exactly is that relationship between energy access and jobs and, and what are the kinds of jobs that are being created and what are the skills gaps. Let me just tell you one or two things that we found um, to answer your question directly, Jenny. Um, we found that uh, when, ex when serving DRE companies or, or off-grid companies or distributed renewable energy companies, um, directly, we found that there are a significant number of jobs being created, as many as in some of the local utility sectors. Um, for solar water pumps specifically, we found that uh, the companies that are, um, you know, uh, distributing uh, both the submersible and the surface water pumps are employing on the order of a few thousand in India and a few hundred in, in Kenya, for instance. But really where the kicker is, is in the productive use that's stimulated by access to um, energy technologies. Um, what we found from, from uh, companies was that anecdotally, uh, there's so much happening um, in the, you know, as I mentioned, the drying, incubation, even honey processing, we heard of milling, grinding. Um, so there's really a lot happening in the space. One of the challenges is that uh, these companies often don't do very rigorous data collection. Uh, of course, they're very time and resource strapped and they need a lot of support in that area. So that's one major, one major takeaway. But that said, um, we were able to draw on estimates from literature and find that productive use jobs are on this, the order of over 60,000 in Kenya and over uh, you know 15,000 right now in Nigeria. So there's really a lot of potential here even in the nascency of this sector um, for, for jobs creation. Uh, the last thing that I'll say is that another thing that we found was that um, there's a lot of, uh, what, you know, creating the jobs is one thing, but filling the jobs is another. And so skills gaps were a major challenge identified by companies, both in terms of their, you know, wanting to hire persons directly, but also in terms of um, you know, helping uh, to stimulate rural entrepreneurship or agripreneurs as a phrase that we heard used. Um, there's really a lot of support that's needed to, um, and in ancillary ways to support rural business. Um, so there's a real investment opportunity there, not just for thinking about the companies and the technologies themselves, but investment in initiatives to support um, skills training. So we are planning to expand the scope of our study. This was the first time that we did it, and we are expanding the scope next year to include more countries, but to also do a deeper dive into productive use. So if there's any organization who is listening that would be keen to support that effort or, or be involved, please let us know. As we just mentioned, you know, the more organizations that get involved in um, coordinated efforts around research, the better. Thanks, Rebecca, and thanks for sharing those numbers. They're they're very compelling, and I'm just thinking about the various you know pieces that all of our organizations have, and one of the huge gaps that was identified in both of the reports is you know policy and, an, and a real enabling environment to uh, facilitate market growth of appliances and productive use. And I'm thinking about you know like the actual sales data that Google has collected, um, the you know market potential numbers that we now have. Um, you know, from, from Lighting Global and Efficiency for Access, and then, you know, this, this initial job report and how that could be potentially packaged and make a really compelling case for policymakers if they can see, you know, those things coming together. There's a huge market potential, but cells are still, you know, relatively low of appliances, and they're also creating jobs. Um, I think I think if we you know bring bring are able to bring all that work together and really advocate for change um, with policymakers, we could have um, you know, significant impact and maybe help to drive some of this change. Um, so I have an, another. I think we have time for at least one more question, and I think I want to hear everybody's perspective on this. But maybe um, start with the Lighting Global team um, because. You know, the Lighting Global team has been working for decades to support the solar home system um, and off-grid lighting sector. Um, and now, as, you know, as we're beginning to see these, you know, some significant growth and uptake in the appliance market and, you know, this merging productive use um, solar market, what, what lessons do you think we can, we can take from what, you know, the Lighting Global program has done in um, the Pico Solar uh, and, and, and solar home system market and, and applied to growing these markets um, and, that, and, and maybe what, what doesn't apply? What, what, are, what are the challenges? What's very different? But what, what maybe um, is, is the same in the, um, 
in the you know programmatic work and the support that Lighting Global has provided to the sector. And then yeah, I would ask similar questions to to Power for All and Gogla uh, as well. So maybe the Lighting Global team can start. Uh, hey Jenny, this is Lindsay. Uh, I think mean, Naomi and I are going to tag team the question, kind of speak to the parallels, and then also some of our key lessons learned. I think overall we we see the exercise is very similar. We're essentially engaging in a market building exercise, which means just like we had been doing um, with the lighting market, um, we're targeting you know, support, demand, supply, technology development, quality, um, the policy environment, and of course, um, finance as well. And um, I think the parallels are most obvious in terms of demand, that there's a huge overlap between who the end consumer is for um, the productive use uh, users that we're targeting in this report and who we've been targeting through the lighting market. Um, and obviously uh, some key parallels in terms of supply, but I think obviously this is where different distribution models uh, may be necessary uh, and slightly divergent from the lighting market. And then I think obviously, and this has been um, emphasized already by Dahlberg, uh, finance is a key challenge that we have been uh, and still are trying to address in the lighting market and will be critical to the development of the productive use market as well. And that could be similar financing mechanisms for the appliance companies and for the consumer and also leveraging of existing models like pay as you go or partnerships with MNFIs or even creative and different solutions uh, for Pulse as well. And maybe just to highlight a few points, I think that Dahlberg also hit very well, but which I think resonate for uh, us here at Lighting Global, is just thinking the question of the who um, and who is best positioned to deliver on uh, productive use technology. Uh, we're already seeing many of the solar companies um, move into this space, but I think with a clear recognition that um, this is a completely new sector for them and uh, they are learning agriculture. So there's um, also great potential for us to see a number of new different uh, companies also entering this kind of nexus uh, between energy and agriculture. And um, maybe just one you know, kind of second point I think is just the uh, kind of emphasis and cr uh, criticalness about behavior change and after sales care that diverges maybe slightly from what we see in the off-grid market where um, with fuel stacking or with reversion to kerosene, when a technology doesn't work, um, delivering on after-sales care for productive use technology is an absolute imperative as is the education of the consumer. Um, but then turning it over to Naomi. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the question is no, it's a little difficult to hear you, actually, Naomi. Um, sorry, is this any better? So I think yeah, I'll just actually pop, pop to your question about what lessons we can learn from over a decade of having worked in this field. Um, I think we see in terms of game changes for the off-grid market that we've learned over time that there are a couple of factors that are really important in terms of developing the private sector environment and these are factors that disproportionately help companies succeed in the market um, compared to other factors and the factors have been I mean these are repeated themes that we've heard throughout all three of the presentations and so these should really be familiar to you but as far as we're concerned absolutely around financing and affordability so working capital debt financing local debt financing is absolutely critical um, we feel are given really uncertain forex um, environment and then around consumer affordability so again this has been covered uh, significantly during the, the, um, the presentations that Darbert did um, other factors are mobile money penetration um, government endorsements were also covered so you know uh, governments welcoming understanding and encouraging um, both the companies as well as the products that they're bringing and then the other factor that we thought was really important um, that we've learned um, from hard graft is really the correct pricing of the product as they enter a market. And just to give sort of a nuanced example, uh, and I'm, I'm appreciative of time, so I will keep it brief, but um, two other things. So one lesson that we learned in Lighting Global is in relation to behavior change. It takes time and 
uh, it's really important that the appliances work and that the customers know how to work it. Um, otherwise, you're facing the risk of market contamination, which is one of the reasons why we focus so much on quality uh, in Lighting Global. And once you have a contaminated market, it becomes such a hard battle to fight um, and encourage companies to sell and consumers to believe. Um, I think just a really important plug is to say over the last 10 years, this market has matured considerably. You know, these products are now legitimate solutions um, to address energy access. Governments and development institutions are kind of increasingly accepting of them. Uh, they accept private sector led decentralized solutions. Um, I remember a time 10 years ago where these were considered slightly gimmicky and that's absolutely no longer the case and that's fantastic. I think the only other thing I might add, Jenny, is just to also highlight um, on behalf of Lighting Global, the work that we're doing to support Pulse in addition to the study that's already been introduced, but also working at a uh, country level through financing mechanisms and uh, market level of research to also contribute to government's understanding of this sector and the potential and then uh, hopefully as well the private sector. Thanks, and, Lindsay. Uh, um, maybe Oh, sorry, I was just going to, I'm just conscious of time, I was just going to ask Sylvia maybe if she wanted to just speak for two minutes on this from a GOGLA perspective, just as they are yeah. seeing more of their members um, start to sell appliances and moving into the space. Right, yeah, thanks Thanks for the question. I think there's a lot of lessons learned, and as Naomi and Lindsay, I think they captured it very well from a financing perspective. I think from our perspective, uh, seeing the companies that have learned so much entering the, the productive use space with all their experience, I think uh, will uh, help them. They will need to definitely understand that that's a different space and they need to still learn a lot about it before they can actually meet all the demands that are there. Uh, from our perspective is really we can learn from all we have done uh, in our regional representation and uh, talking with governments and really to go down to the level to make them understand as much as possible and make sure that the company's voice is heard in the most neutral way as possible but still quite strong enough. So I think that it, a lot of uh, productive use companies are starting to join our our membership base and, and we see how different and how similar they are and how similar challenges uh, we can address with the experience we had on the lighting side together with all the partners. I think the challenge is really going to be on a single country level as these products, they don't look dram dramatically different than the AC uh, grid ones, right? So I think it's going to be a different conversation to showing them how much better they are technically without going into too much technical conversations. Thank you. Um, and again, just for a short of time, Rebecca, I, sorry, I, I, I don't know if you want to just take 30 seconds and just say any, you know, key lesson maybe you've learned um, for Power for All. Sure, sure. I would just say that I think um, that, you know, of course, there's stronger collaboration that's needed on developing industry relevant curricula and so on for um, for supporting jobs creation and, uh, and soft skills training. But I also really think it's important to note that these energy conversations are often lumped into infrastructure conversations as far as policy goes. And so it's really important for us to help to create advocates across education, health, food security, rural development to lobby for better data, to lobby for, you know, more support for these kinds of organizations and companies as well. Totally agree. Thank you so much, Rebecca. And sorry, we didn't get a chance to address the audience questions, but as um, Kamira said, we'll be, uh, we can email those out and I'll turn, hand it back to you, Kamira, to close up. Yes, absolutely. Yes, thank you guys so much for that um, expert panelist. We really appreciate it. And just like um, Jenny said, we won't be able to get to those um, audience questions today, but I really appreciate you guys' questions. Please keep them coming. We're going to send them all to the panelists and to our presenters today, and they will get back to your questions inv individually um, as soon as possible. So with that, um, on behalf of the Clean Energy Solutions Center, I'd like to extend a thank you to all of our expert panelists and to our attendees for participating in today's webinar. We very much appreciate your time and hope in return that we're, there were some valuable insights that you can take back to your ministries, departments, or organizations. We also invite you to inform your colleagues and those in your networks about the Solution Center resources and services, including no-cost policy support through our Ask an Expert service. 
I invite you to check the Solution Center website if you would like to view the slides and listen to the recording of today's presentation as well as previously held webinars. Additionally, you will find information on upcoming webinars and other training events. We are also posting our webinar recordings on the Clean Energy Solutions Center YouTube channel, but please allow about a week for the audio recording to be posted. Finally, I would like, I would like to kindly ask you to take a moment to complete the short survey that will appear when we conclude this webinar. Please enjoy the rest of your day, and we hope to see you again at future Clean Energy Solutions Center events, and this concludes our webinar. Thank you guys so much. Bye-bye.